been a drought for way too long. We need to sing our freedom song. Oh Lord, we need a touch from you. We really need a touch from you. Lord, we need to hear your voice. Our hearts are open, we have no choice. Oh, Lord, we need a touch from you. We really need a touch from you. Send your last.
I'd like to say hello to all of our church family members, certainly to all of our viewers who are joining us through Facebook or live stream, certainly through uh, our other avenues of you being able to join us, tune in with us today. We're so delighted to have you with us as you come and share with us uh, on the day of the Lord of our midweek studies. I'd like to certainly say uh, to all of our viewers and all of our family members uh, to do that, we'd like to encourage you to join us uh, beginning on next week as we prepare ourselves going into uh, the Holy Week. We're going to be uh, having uh, preachers uh, each night, Monday all the way up to which will take place on Friday at noon. Uh, so we'd like to encourage you to join us, share with your family, your perhaps co-workers or friends uh, on our Holy Week services that will, you will see entitled uh, The Week That Changed the World. Uh, the week that led up to Christ and ultimately to his crucifixion uh, and events to happen leading up to that. It was the week that many call it that literally changed uh, the world. So that's our theme this year. Uh, the week that changed the world is for uh, you to join us and celebrate with us as we celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Savior. We're so delighted to have you with us today and without you there can be no us uh, to share and we just truly thank uh, God for your presence and we look for you continually uh, sharing with us and telling us things that we can still do to communicate to you better. Just feel free to reach out to us here at the church and let us know what we can do uh, to continue to stay connected with you and you certainly continue to stay engaged and connected with us. Uh, uh, as I say again on this time next week we will not have our Bible studies noon or Wednesday night as we get ready to celebrate the Holy Week services. So we want you to kind of uh, be reminded for that. We will not be having the noonday or our Wednesday night Bible studies on next week because we'll be preparing to celebrate uh, the week of the Lord and uh, our Savior as he tabernacled with us for the last week before his crucifixion, the week that changed the world. So we can carry your market calendar and certainly take the time to join us. But until then... We certainly thank you for joining us today. We will be using as a scripture reference the King James Version. Every so often I may use uh, God's Word translation. We know it to be called uh, the GW translation. And we hopefully you will join us uh, in you, you using your Bible or perhaps using a different writer uh, of a Bible or commentary. That's fine. Uh, we hope that you'll join us. But again, we're going to pick up today as we we'll venture and look at this next miracle that Jesus now transitioned from feeding the 4,000 we looked at last Wednesday, and now he's going to another little small town that he's eventually going to say and speak about that's not going to be in a positive light, uh, but he's going to do something positive while he's there. Uh, and so we look forward to you joining us. We're going to be reading a few passages of Scripture out the Bible uh, just as a backdrop to reassure you what I'm sharing, sharing with you when Jesus pronounced Upon this city, uh, I'll give you a scripture reference so you can go back, read with us in your leisure uh, to get a full picture of why Jesus said what he said and, and, and does what he does. But uh, we certainly thank you uh, for joining us. I ask that you join with me just for a few moments as we ask and invite God into our hearts for a word of prayer as we go into the studying of these miracles of the Lord. Let us pray. Kind God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your power. We thank you for you reminding us as your disciples, even in this 21st century when we're in, that you're still working and performing miracles. You're still doing the miraculous uh, in spite of all things. We thank you for keeping us safe and keeping us out of harm's way, even when harm's way is always in our presence. You protect us and you guard us from seen, seen danger and unseen danger. And for that, we say thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the ability to be able to come in our sacred space of our homes, living room, or kitchen, wherever it may be, to join uh, in a moment of studying the word of God together. And as we glean together on this day, uh, the miracles that you perform throughout the Bible, we are reminded you're still working miracles. And for that, we say thank you, and we praise your name now. Bless the, the viewers, bless the hearers as we receive the word of God together. We bless and praise your holy name for this is your servant's prayer. We pray together in faith with our brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Again, amen. We thank you for joining us today. We're excited uh, for what the Lord is doing and has done and is continually to do in your life as well as in my life. Today we're going to look at another miracle, which would be miracle number 25. We then went through 24 miracles. Now we're at number 25 today. This miracle now is going to deal with Jesus as he heals a blind man at a little city called Bethsaida. At a little city called, or a little town called Bethsaida. Jesus is going to perform this miracle. And this miracle is going to be recorded out of John's Mark's Gospel, the 8th chapter, verses 22 through 26. Again, John Mark's Gospel, chapter 22 through chapter, I mean, cha chapter 8, I'm sorry, verses 22 through verse number 26. And what I want to do, I want to read those passages of scripture for you, give you the backdrop of what it says uh, in the King James translation of John Mark's account of what happened in this little town called Bethsaida. And it, I'm going to commence reading now at chapter 8 of Mark's gospel, beginning at verse 22. And this is what it reads. It says, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. Those are, he led him out of the town. That's important. We'll see why. And when he had spit on his eyes, that's important, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And the next verse says like this, uh, and, that after, and, and after that he put his hands again on his eyes, and he looked up and said in verse 24, I see men as trees walking. Verse 25, he says, after that, he put his hands again on his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. In verse 26, I'll conclude. And he sent him away to his house, saying, neither go into the town. That's important. Nor tell it to any in the town. Now, what town is Jesus talking about in this particular 26 verse? He's talking about the little town called Bethsaida. The little town called Bethsaida. He tells the man, do not go back to this town uh, to show them you've been, in other words, you've been healed. Don't tell them what has happened. Now, let me say this, ladies and gentlemen, in the outset that we find here uh, this remarkable parable, this remarkable miracle of Jesus now performing another miracle of someone that is blind. This is not the first time he performs a miracle of someone that is blind, but this is the one that he does something very unique compared to the other ones that he does relating to anyone that was blind that was brought to his attention. And this particular one, uh, it says that Jesus now returns to this little town called Bethsaida. And this little town called Bethsaida was near a little town called Galilee, the home where scholars suggest where Jesus uh, brings Peter, Andrew, and Philip to be a part of his preaching, teaching, and healing ministry. We find in this particular uh, parable, I meant sorry, not parable, this particular miracle today that Jesus now is confronted by some individuals who bring to him a man that is, is blind. Didn't say he was born blind, but he's blind. In other words, some translation said he, he had caring friends that brought a blind man to Jesus. Those who brought him to Jesus, these individuals had faith. Not the man that was blind, but those who brought this blind man to Jesus, they had faith. They believe, not the blind man, they believe that Jesus could heal him. Interestingly to know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jesus did not heal the man in the presence of those who brought him. That's amazing. Now, they had faith, but Jesus does not heal this blind man in front of his friends, in front of all the spectators. He does not perform this miracle in front of the crowd in essence. He does not do this in front of the friends or those who are or friends who brought him to Jesus. And nor in the company of the crowd. You ask yourself, well, why? Why would not Jesus not do that in front of his friends to believe to have faith, nor the crowd? 
Well, he led the man, the scripture says, out of the little town called Bethsaida. He took the man out of the outskirts of the town called Bethsaida. And he did something very unsanitary, something very insanitary. We know he does that because uh, over in, uh, uh, in uh, verse number of 23, it says that he has spit on the man's eyes. That's insanitary, uh, as we know it to be, even as of now. Very insanitary. So, but Jesus does this miracle uniquely compared to all the other healing miracles related to anyone that is blind. It's specifically, he spits on the man's eyes. And that's uh, unsanitary. We know that to be true. But now if you look at it from uh, the perspective of how some Jewish individual looked at it, they knew it to be insanitary. But to Jesus, it uh, was not insanitary because Jesus was perfect. Jesus had no impurities in his blood, which means he had no impurities even in his spittle. But just a simple fact, looking at it from a surface level, it looked quite naturally to be very unsanitary. And so it says that he spits on the man's eyes, in, on his eyes, and put his hands upon him. Many miracles Jesus performed, he didn't have to touch people. But this one particularly, interestingly, he does. Not only does he does one thing, he spit, which was insanitary to, to do anything relating to any kind of healing. But then he puts his hands on the man's eyes after he spits on the man's eyes and he asks him if he saw aught. That's strange, unusual. Takes the man out of town, takes the man out of the company of his friends, Take the man out in front, away from the crowd, the spectators, speculators, spits on the man's eyes, puts his hands in on the man's eyes, and asks him, can you see art? Now, we know it's some sanitary, I said earlier. He chooses not to open his eyes, uh, open the man's eyes as he did in other instances. And I'll talk about that in a brief moment. Question. He could have touched his eyes or spoke a command and the man's sight would have been restored. We know that because he'd done it prior. Question was to be asked, why did he not do it this time? Well, it's unusual because Mark, uh, compared to the other writers, Mark is, uh, he writes to the Romans. Remember now, Romans are particular uh, about rules and laws and di uh, directives. They are sort of rigid. They are individuals who demand uh, uh, what we would call uh, government, laws, and orders, and control. That's what the Romans, so John Mark writes to the Romans now compared to Matthew, Luke, and John. Now, the spit represented the eye salve with Christ anoint the eyes of those who are spiritually blind. Keep that in mind now. When he uses spittle and, and, and what we call considered to be a spittle, it, it represents those that were spiritually blind. So this man was not only just physically disabled, that he was not able to see physically, but Jesus knew this man was spiritually blind. So he uses eyesight, which is with spittle, because this man was spiritually blind. Well, guess what? Many of us can see right now through the natural eyes, but many of us, even as today, even as I speak to you, some are still in our families and loved ones and others we know, they are spiritually blind. They can see naturally, but they cannot see anything spiritually. Not able to decipher things that are happening around them that is based upon the spirit world, things that are spiritual. So, they are considered to be, as Christ does, this blind man here. Not born blind now. Some believe he may have either became blind because of perhaps a disease or an incident. We don't know. It does, the Bible does not go in depth of how he became blind, but we know he was not born blind. And for that reason, <clears throat> Jesus uh, used eye, a spittle with, as an eye salve in his healing hand to heal this man and anoint his eyes for those that are what we call, again, spiritually blind. But what I want to say here, and I'm going to show you a video in a few moments, I want you to notice something, uh, brothers and sisters, in this particular parable, parable right here, that uh, 
in this section of John Mark's gospel, this miracle of this blind man uh, is very unique because, again, he takes them outside of the little town of Bethsaida. And perhaps we can see it in, 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 in the illustration of uh, the disciples because he wants to show even the spiritual condition of the disciples as well. And you can go back and read Mark 8 and verse 18, and you'll see <clears throat> what I mean by that. Now, the Jewish readers uh, will connect uh, these uh, miracles. We know the deaf man, but here we're looking at the blind man with the Messianic promises, uh, which is quoted out of Isaiah book chapter 35. And I encourage you, strongly encourage you to go back and read the book of Isaiah chapter number 35, how it gives reference to uh, just what we call the Messianic promise of Jesus by these Jewish readers. Now, in this situation here today, in this particular miracle of uh, the blind man, they brought him to Jesus. And, and I want you to notice that Jesus led the man away from the crowds. In fact, in the latter case, he took the man outside of the city of Bethsaida. And now you ask the question, well, why, why would he do that? Why, preacher, why would Jesus take this blind man outside of the confines of the little town called Bethsaida? Well, we're going to see why. Probably because the city of Bethsaida had already been, here it is, been judged. Been judged and judged of what? They were judged because of their unbelief, because of their unbelief. And because of their unbelief, Jesus took this blind man and led him out on the outskirts of the city that he had already pronounced judgment against. And the judgment was because of their unbelief. Now, this is very important. I want you to join me. If you got a Bible or you got something that you can read with me and relate to Scripture, I'm going to give you a reference in the book of Matthew. I know we're in the book of Mark, but I want to go back and look at the book of Matthew. And I'm going to give you a few moments to turn to it. Matthew chapter 11. And I want to lift to your hearing verse 21, 22, 23, and 24. Listen to what Jesus says or how he pronounced this judgment on this little town now where he's getting ready to perform this miracle on the outskirts of Bethsaida. He does not do this in front of the people because he knows they already have an unbelieving spirit. And watch what he does or what he pronounces in Matthew's gospel. Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to commence reading now, beginning at verse 21. Listen to what Jesus says. Woe unto thee, cherubim. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you, about the little city now, these two cities, had been done in Tyrant and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Verse 22, Matthew chapter 11, listen to what he says. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyrant and Sidon at the day of judgment. Jesus is saying here literally to Bethsaida, you are worse than Tyron and Sidon. The judgment upon them is not going to be as worse as going to be upon you. This little town called C uh, uh, Bethsaida. So he says here in verse 22, uh, the, the day of judgment, it will be harsher on you than it is upon uh, Tyra and Sidon. Verse 23, Matthew 11, I'm still reading. And thou, watch the word, Capernaum, which I told you last week, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. Now, this is Jesus speaking. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sidon, it would have remained until this day. I'm sorry, not Sidon, done in the city of Sodom. It would have remained until this day. But I say unto you, verse 24, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. 
Listen, now we all know what Jesus, what the word of God did to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Je Jesus is pronouncing here on the little town called Bethsaida, you're worse. You're worse than them. That because of your unbelief, because of your unbelief, wow. So now we see why Jesus was not going to do this miracle in front of the citizens and the people or that crowd in the little town of Bethsaida because prior they already been pronounced against judgment against them and the judgment was because of their unbelief. And brothers and sisters, that's a tragic word when you don't believe God, when you literally see him perform things and bring you out and yet you refuse to believe him. And he pronounces the judgment of damnation upon Bethsaida. Right there, Matthew chapter 11, verses 21 through 24. No more evidence will be given to them who is them, the little city called, or the little town called Bethsaida. Now, the unique thing about this miracle, brothers and sisters, of the healing is it occurred gradually. Notice now when this blind man uh, is going to venture see, it does not happen instantly scriptures lets us know this blind man gets it gains his sight how gradually and not instantly now what i want to do i'm going to pause right here and i want to show you a short video and i want to say from the outset that uh, on this video now that bethlehem baptist church or the media ministry we, we do not uh, own the rights to this video we don't own it we just Record it to show it to you just as a piece for you to kind of get a visual at least about this particular miracle. So I thank you for joining me and just listening and observing. Again, I know the Bethlehem or our media ministry uh, do not have the rights of this video. We're just showing it to you as just as a teaching piece in our Bible study. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Amen. Thank you for joining us. That was a brief presentation, a clip of a video that we want you to just kind of get a, a visual feel of this lesson today about this miracle dealing with uh, the healing of this blind man uh, in a little town called Bethsaida. Now, uh, as I said, as I alluded to you a little earlier in this particular presentation, uh, the spittle or the spit represented the eye salve uh, where with Christ anoints of the eyes of those who are spiritually, key word, spiritually blind, spiritually blind. I'm going to quote to you in one of our presentations, that's probably presentation five. I'm going to quote to you some scriptures, Revelations 3 and 18, Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. And I want you to see on the screens there what I mean by the spit represented the eye salve where with Christ anoints the eyes of those who are spiritually blind. Listen to what these scriptures read in your hearing. You write them down. Revelation chapter 3, look at verse number 18, and it reads thusly. Uh, he says, I counseled uh, thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that 
the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Watch the language. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve. There it is. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. That thou mayest see. Remember now, the spittle that may, is a form of an eye salve for those that are spiritually blind. Spiritually blind because when you don't see nakedness, you can have on clothes and still be naked in God's sight. And those who are spiritually able to see, naked meaning you're still empty. You have nothing. You're void of nothing. But when you spiritually can see, then you can see that. But if you are not spiritually uh, uh, able to see, then you can't see that through the natural or the carnal eye. And so that's important that we get this, what uh, the book of Revelation tells us, the last book of the Bible. He says, the shame of thy nakedness. All right. Notice what the prophet Isaiah says, the next verse over, next chapter over, a few chapters back, I'm sorry. The prophet of Isaiah, listen to what it says in the Old Testament. Isaiah says this, chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to, the, to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and to open of the eyes. Watch verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our prison to them that are bound. God to comfort all that mourn. So the prophet even prophecy of Isaiah even tells us the same thing about uh this level of blindness, spiritual blindness. But look what Luke says in chapter 4, verse 16 through number 19. Here goes the next scripture we're reading, dealing with now. Remember, we're talking about the spittle that represents the eye salve, where with Christ anoints the eyes of those who are spiritually blind. Luke 4, 16 through 19 says this. And he came to Nazareth where... He had been brought up, and as his customs was, he went into the synagogue. He went, in other words, he went to the church house on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Verse 17 of Luke 4 says, And there was deliverance unto him, there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me <laughs> to preach the gospel of the, to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind and to set at liberty. That word liberty means to be free, to set at freedom them that are bruise verse 19 to preach the acceptable year of the lord it is by his anointing while we're able to see and the prophet uh writes this what jesus says and does in luke's account of this gospel now if you go on and keep reading you discover something else uh in this lesson over in first corinthians chapter 13 i'm still dealing with now the peace, I'm on this story. We're going to go back to the blind man in a few seconds. Uh, as it relates to the eye salve, the spirit of the eye salve, where Christ anoint the eyes of those who are spiritually blind. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, in verse 2, you will see it read, it read like this. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. In other words, if I don't have love, I can't operate in the way God wants me to operate to do the work in the will of the Lord. Now, in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, we just read it earlier. I'm going to lift again your hearing, verse 24, 5, and 6. Listen what it says again. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees. 
In other words, this blind man not seeing fully clearly yet because he, as, when he first initially opened his eyes, it looks like he said he see men, but they look like trees. Remember that because Jesus told him to look up. All right. Verse 25, after that, he puts his hands again, there you go, upon his eyes and made him look up. It's the second touch. And he was restored and saw every man what? Clearly. In verse 25, 26, and he sent him away to his house. Notice now, he don't tell him to go back to the town or the city of Bethsaida, or Bethsaida but he says, go to Sends him, sends him to his own house, saying, neither go into the town. There it is. We done told you why. Because they are unbelievers. He's already pronounced their damnation. Don't go back to that town. Don't go back to Bethsaida. Nor tell it to any, to any in that town. Because they have already been written off as Christ uh, pronounces this to them. And notice now. That when, when uh, Jesus asked a man what he saw, what he saw uh, uh, in the latter part of verse 23 and then going into verse 24 and 25, he asked him, what did he saw? He could only respond in part. He could not see clearly because it says he see men walking, but they look like trees. That's what he said in verse 24. So he was not still seeing clearly. All right. All he saw was blurred. All the things he saw was wavering images of trees. The man's sight was only partially restored. All right. Remember I told you it happened gradually. It didn't happen instantly. This blind man's sight was restored gradually. I want to give you three reasons why uh, I, I feel that uh, this blind man's sight was restored uh, gradually. Uh, on the next uh, piece, uh, you'll, you'll see on the, on the, on the screens here uh, that when Jesus asked the man what did he saw, he could only respond in part. He could, uh, he could not see clearly. All he saw was blurred, wavering images of trees. He said the men looked like trees, and the man's sight was only partially re restored. Now, I need to share this with you, ladies and gentlemen. You watch that screen right there. You're going to see why. Uh, this, the blind, this blind man was seeing uh, partially. And the reason he was seeing partially was for a reason he was seeing things partially. There are three stages in this case, or three stages given to this blind man's healing. First of all, we see his blindness. Right down the screen, we see his blindness. Now, I want you to know in this process, he could have made this man see clearly. Jesus could have if he really wanted to at the very beginning. But there is a lesson for this man. But also there's a lesson for you and I why this blind man did not see instantly. He became able to see gradually. Three reasons why. You see right on the screen. You write them down. Three stages given in this particular healing. Number one, the blindness of this man. We all, in other words, we are all First, spiritually blind. Before we got saved, before we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we were still walking in darkness, even though we could see naturally. We could see light, we could see things naturally, but spiritually, we were still walking in darkness until we got, until we accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And when that happened, we all became what we would call spiritually able to see. We started seeing things a little more clearly because guess what? We're no longer now walking in darkness. We're able to see through spiritual light. And so this blind man, he was blind and he could not see. And, and we see that uh, uh, as the old folks say in the old church and old hymn books, we sang that old song in the old church, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And the next line goes on and says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. And then he says, I was blind, but now I see. That was sung in the old church. And it's still true today. When you are uh, an unbeliever of the Lord Jesus Christ, like these folk in this town of Bethsaida, they, they were spiritually blind. They could not see the miracles that Jesus performed. They did not accept what he was doing. And we know what happened. There was pronounced judgment that was not good for that town of Bethsaida. So, 
the first reason, the first stage was given in this healing was the man was blind. Not only could he not see physically, but he was not able to see even spiritually. Second thing we see here is as we come, could pull this together is this. He was able to see, but he had what we call partial sight. Partial sight. And what do I mean by partial sight? This, ladies and gentlemen, uh, partial sight, this is not our condition today. This is the condition of all mankind even today. You say, well, why is that? Well, there are many things we don't understand. Many things we don't or we're not able to see. That we're not able to see. And that's very, very uh, important. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, that should be 1 Corinthians, not Chronicles. I had that wrong. Forgive me on that. It should be 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2, says it like this. Every now and then, I'm sorry, he says it like this. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, I shall see him more clearly, and I shall see him for myself. So in other words, when you're still walking in darkness, you are still a blind spiritually. But when Christ comes into your life, when Christ takes residence in your heart, you like I, when that happens immediately, our sight begins to be restored spiritually that we be able to begin to see things far more clearly. You didn't see things. You may have saw it when you was uh, spiritually blind, but you didn't really see it. Because you did not have the spirit of God residing in you. But when that spirit of God took residence in your life, in your heart, it affected not only your mind, your body, your soul, but also affect your eyesight. That you're not able to see things spiritually. You're able to see people around you differently. You're able to pick up things more clearly. You're able to be more uh, in tune, in sync with the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God now has residence in you. And when that Spirit of God has that residence inside you, then in essence, you're now able to see more clearly. And when you're able to see more clearly, you begin to see uh, friends different. You begin to even see family different. You begin to even see uh, your close loved ones different. You even begin to see yourself differently, all because you are now starting to see things more clearly. You're not fully clearly yet because it is a partial sight. And that's why that man makes that statement in a latter part of verse 24. He says, I see men and they look like trees. And it's because his sight was not fully restored yet. He was not, not only physically, but yet he was not there fully there yet spiritually. All right. And then there's a third reason uh, why this man was able to uh, be restored his sight after he received his come from out his blindness after he began to see partially then as God touches him again he's now able to have what you would call perfect sight perfect sight those anybody who goes to get their eyes checked get their eyes checked from an optometrist would know uh, when you go get your eyes checked if he tells you that you have 20-20 vision, that means you can see things perfect. You see things clearly, precisely. Uh, and if not, then quite naturally, he has to describe either some medicine or you have to probably eventually wear glasses to help you to be able to focus and see things more clearly. This man was not born blind, but for whatever reason, he was blind. It could have been because of an incident. could have been because of the disease. We don't know. But when they brought him to Jesus... Remember now, he takes him out of the city. He uh, used eye spittle with eye salve, touches the man. The man began to see partially. Jesus comes and then touches him again, finally the second time. And now he sees, the scripture says, far more clearly. And you say, well, how do you know he sees far more clearly? Because verse 25 of Mark 8 says, after he put his hands again upon him, his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored, and he saw every man clearly. That's what verse 25 says. He saw every man clearly because early in verse 24, he said it looked like they looked like tall trees. Uh, that means he would have partial sight. But when Jesus touches him again, his, his sight restored 
perfectly. In other words, this man has 20-20 vision. Not only physically, but he has 20-20 vision, spiritual vision. And when, he, and when we come into this presence, when we come into the Lord's presence, and that's when we'll really be able to see people, things, and the world and life more clearly. People say, well, as you get older, you begin to see things differently. Because once you accept Christ in your life, things begin to become more clearly. You begin to take the film off. You begin to take uh, the glare and the blur off of things that you see, but you didn't see it clearly. As he began to, you grow spiritually, you become more in sync with God. He began to wipe the blur. He began to wipe uh, uh, the, the, the smudge that you did not see. He began to clean things and your eye spiritually and physically began to come sharpened until you begin to see life, issues, things of this world far more clearly. And so we see here this man had perfect sight, which was the third stage, which was what we call perfect vision where well, he has 2020 spiritual vision and when i said again and when you come in the presence of god that's when you're really able to see things far more clearly and you'll notice that when our lord had finished this miracle with this man that was blind that was brought to him he had healed this man perfectly he healed this man perfectly and let me say this to you ladies and gentlemen have you ever noticed the difference methods that our lord jesus christ used when it came to open the eyes of blind throughout the bible and other miracles as i said i will tell you a little earlier you remember now uh, here at the Bethsaida, uh when he healed this blind man he touched his eyes so this man had an experience with christ physically by a touch but in the other miracles that dealt with the blind he didn't touch for you remember when jesus healed blind Bartimaeus Bartimaeus didn't he did not touch Bartimaeus uh, all he was told uh, to do from Jesus was blind, blind Bartimaeus was from a distance go with your faith alone for your eyes are open because he told blind Bartimaeus because of your faith you are already healed and so I'm saying to you the same way as we as Jesus performed this miracle today uh, he touched this blind man he he spit on the man's eyes and touched him twice. And the man moved from partial sight to perfect sight. Blind Bartimaeus didn't get a touch. He pronounced the blessing on him. He pronounced the blessing on him. As some suggest, maybe blind Bartimaeus had the faith and he was not spiritually blind. He was just physically blind. All right. You remember also that um, not only did he um, use the method of uh, telling uh, like Bartimaeus that he's healed but you recall also uh, in this lesson uh, that uh, Jesus also performed something uniquely uh, different uh, from the disciples for them to witness let me find it I'm going to use it as a talking point and that is this right here that after he uh, performed this particular miracle uh, of this of this man he, he does something uniquely different he tells him uh, not to go back to the town but go home ladies and gentlemen there's nothing more powerful when you find and receive the power and the gift of God that you take it back home and let others be a witness to see the goodness of God what God has done in your life and so this this blind man uh, uh, I can imagine he wanted everybody in the town the city to know that uh, certainly his friends they believed he could be healed and he was healed but I can imagine he wanted to run back into the city of Bethsaida to tell them, uh, look at me, I can see now. I was blind, but now I can see. But Jesus gives him a directive. He gives him a specific order. No, don't go back to the city of Bethsaida. You don't need to go back to there to them and let them see. You don't need to go back to witness for me there. I want you to go home and let your family see this miraculous miracle. And so as, as I come to the close here, like Jesus performed many of those other miracles uh, in, in, these, uh, in these lessons today, uh, I can certainly uh, test and tell you uh, that, that uh, these miracles are a perfect example for us to see how our Lord still work and perform these miraculous miracles. 
And so I say to you today, my brothers and sisters in the Lord and in the faith, that uh, if you have faith in God, whatever it is that God does in your life, go back and be a witness to your home. Go back and be a witness to your close companions, your close friends. Let them know what God done in your life. And when that happens, you will be able to get the message out far better than anybody else. By you doing that, family and friends can take the same gospel that you share with them as a witness, as a miracle yourself about the goodness of God. And so I certainly thank you uh, for joining us today. And uh, where well, we'll come back tonight. I certainly thank you uh, for that. And I want you to know uh, that you are a walking miracle. You are a walking miracle. When you got up this day, you are a miracle. And I want your family members to know who's sitting close by you or your children, grandchildren, whoever it may be in the house with you or if you're all alone, let him or her know they're looking at a miracle. They are connected to a miracle. They are your family members. Let your family members know I'm a miracle. Let your friends know I'm a miracle. Every day you get up, every day you have the movement of limbs, and your mind is still regulating, and you got movement of life, guess what? You are a miracle. And so as we come to the close of this, always remember, uh, Jesus is still performing miracles. He did it over 2,000 years ago. He's still doing it today. He said, well, how? Because you're looking at a miracle, and I'm talking to a miracle, and I'm looking at a miracle in you. You and I will God's miracles. To God be the glory for the great and marvelous things that he has, is, and will continually to do. I certainly encourage you to join us on tomorrow for our food box giveaway. Encourage others you think may need some. Uh, let them know they can come back tomorrow here between the hours 11.30 and 12. Second of all, I certainly want to say thank you for your prayers as you join us throughout this Lenten season reading scriptures daily, praying, meditating, or fasting of something as we get heightened for this Lenten season. And last but not leastly, I look forward to you joining us on during our Holy Week celebrations as we look at the week that changed the world. We will have preachers every night. Come on and join us. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell them to tune in at bbcfamily.net. Go to our live stream service. And watch us nightly, amen, as we have the preaching of the gospel of all of the week for Holy Week. And certainly you do not want to miss us on this coming Sunday for Palm Sunday as we talk about Jesus coming into that great, great city, the reason why he did it. And then join us on Easter Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday morning. We're going to have church service out in the church uh, parking lot. You don't want to miss that service. You want to be here and be a part of Sunday morning Easter service. Come on, bring your little ones, your children, grandchildren. Bring aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews. Bring them all out. We're going to have a good time in the Lord having worship service together in the church parking lot Easter Sunday morning. We thank you. We pray for you as you pray for us. And we pray to God's blessings where we help you get where God wants you to be in your spiritual journey. On behalf of myself and certainly uh, the, you as members and friends and our media ministry, we say thank you. We continue to thank you for your support and for your prayers. Be blessed in the Lord. Be safe. Be well until we see each other again. Take care. We'll see you the next time. Until then, walk in the newness of the Lord.